Not your everyday Sunday as it reflects off the U.S. men's national team. And we will talk about the game with Uruguay here shortly. But it began with a very important detail. Who are they going to play in their first game at the World Cup November the 21st? We found out it's going to be Wales. Wales forever. And while we feel bad for Ukraine, obviously, uh, what an incredible story that would be. Time to move on. Wales is a great story. Ukraine, uh, obviously, got bigger issues to deal with than to be playing at the World Cup. You would have loved to have had a distraction for the Ukrainian people. Not everything's fair, and the Ukrainians will be the first to tell you that. So we move on. We have an, a, an incredible story in Wales. And I, I, look, the Ukraine story uh, not being fulfilled, you should take nothing away from what Wales has done. And I thought John Champion, Taylor Trollman, did a really nice job. John, because he knows the sport, pivoting from the Ukrainian story on the ESPN broadcast, of course, to that of uh, Wales. And by the way, ESPN. ESPN. <sighs> End of the game. Incredible moment there in, in Cardiff. And you're soaking it all in. And they get out of there. Because they have a hockey game or something to go to. So, eject. It's just, it's hard to grow the sport. When you have visuals like that, don't leave it. But anyway, Wales is a really interesting story because uh, I think some of the younger audience feel like Wales have a good team. It's a very small country. It's, it's next to England, which uh, that, that kind of rubs off on you. But their national sport is and always has been rugby. Rugby is where, you know, they make World Cup semifinals. Haven't made a final yet. I would love to see it. There is nothing like a home Wales rugby game. And the soccer's getting there too, but when they sing Land of Their Fathers, Land of My Fathers, or what, there's a very musical people. So the Welsh fans, very underrated, are going to bring a lot to the World Cup. That's going to be a great game. It's also going to be a game where the United States are going to grind because Wales sat back. They got the goal, and that doomed Ukraine, obviously, very early. This is going to feel a lot like playing a team from CONCACAF for the U.S., except you got Gareth Bale. So careful of the counterattacks. The U.S. will be favorites. And from what I've seen over the last week or so, I feel the U.S. is really growing into this. And we're here to talk about the USA-Uruguay game here on the Soccer OG. I'm sorry. Check out the Soccer OG podcast where all podcasts are available. I had Christopher Sullivan. Christopher Sullivan's a great friend of mine. And I'm telling you, he has had two of the best performing podcasts I've ever had. So people must love Suli. I must bring Suli back. So check that out. There'll be a new podcast recapping USA, Uruguay, and everything about the World Cup with Charles Bohem, who's a, a beloved writer and a really good dude. So I'm looking forward to having that conversation. Check out the Soccer OG podcast and like and subscribe here. Like and subscribe. Do it. So let's talk about the US game. Scoreless with Uruguay. This was the starting 11. There were four changes for Greg Berhalter. Uh, Sean Johnson coming in. So he wasn't in the original squad, and then he gets in there, which uh, he, had a nice, he had a nice game. Uh, I believe he was called man of the match because he uh, didn't have to make too many saves. He made the one great kick save. Joe Scally comes in, and we're always going to talk about Joe Scally because it was a big talking point. Started at left back, then moved to right back. Aaron Long, Walker Zimmerman, DeAndre Yedlin at right back. In the midfield, it was Tyler Adams, Weston McKinney, who comes in. He was on a minutes restriction, so he came off. Uh, when did he come off? He came off at the half. So you also had Musa. We'll talk about him. He was my man of the match, and I think many other people's man of the match. Christian Pulisic, Jesus Ferreira, and Tim Weah. Quickly, we'll run through the subs. Ariola for McKinney at the half after the minutes restriction. Eric Palmer Brown in for Aaron Long. Brendan Aronson for Tim Weah. 61st minute, Haji Wright comes into the game for Jesus Ferreira. 62nd minute, Anthony Robinson for DeAndre Yedlin. 85th minute, Luca Della Torre for Eunice Musa. So they got the six changes. There was this little hullabaloo, which was really, it was very distracting. And I wish they didn't give him much attention because Diego Alonso put in a, a seventh sub. And the U.S. soccer kind of got a bent out of shape. I'm like, who cares? Who cares? That should have come and gone. But... There it was. So the game began with Uruguay. Uh, it was their B team. I'm reluctant to call A's and B's because this was a very good 11 for Uruguay. Uh, Darwin Nunez is their, their most talented forward right now. He's valued at $80 million. Someone's going to pay him and he's going to be playing at big clubs. We're all going to know his name. 
He's just got to wait his turn behind Edison Cavani. There is, uh, he is there, he is going to be their top option. You, you got to kiss the ring a little bit. I would take, if you have me to pick a player, I'm taking um, Darwin Nunez seven out of seven times or 10 out of 10 times. Uh, you had legendary players, uh, Fernando Muslera, Diego Godin, who are past their prime, but still legends. So to call them B anything is not accurate. Then you had uh, Matias Vina, who I think will be starting for Uruguay at the World Cup. I think he will be on the left side. He's that good. And uh, Jesus, Jose Jimenez is really good. Some good prospects around there. So this was a, And then they brought the A-teamers in the second half. So it was just mistiming, really. I, I remember Uruguay had one less game of rest because they played Mexico a day after the U.S. played Morocco. So I, I wouldn't get too discouraged. That's a very strong 11, and the U.S. held their own. It, uh, it was a messy game, so you would, uh, it, was not, it was not easy to watch, uh, like the Morocco game, obviously. But I think at the, at the end of the day, with so many concerns and the defense still out of sync, we don't know what, what's going wrong. We could say it's maybe Aaron Long's not catching up to speed. I think we saw some signs of that. I thought he played good against Morocco, looked a little bit uh, bent out of shape. And he was, he's taken a leadership role, but there's a lot of communication with Scally and Walker Zimmerman too much for my liking. You want that to be a well-oiled machine, and it's not at this point. DeAndre Yedlin was, uh, was a little bit hairy on that. And then Joe Scally, uh, but, uh, before, and of course, Sean Johnson, who becomes the 14th goalkeeper with double-digit caps. But you get another 90 minutes without conceding a goal. Now, they should have conceded a couple. They should have conceded against Morocco. They missed the penalty. But this is the kind of game you might get at the World Cup where things don't work out. A team that you're, is on your level or above. And if you walk out with a result like that, you're like, all right, all right, move on to the next one. You want one of those grinded out games because you're going to see it. Might be against the Welsh. Probably is going to be the Welsh. But I think with Uruguay, you could imitate a little bit with the English. The English didn't have a, a good window here. And I don't want to look too far into the performances. But I do want to look a little bit into the performances. This is different. This is a dress rehearsal, which I told you here. So when the U.S. played a very similar 11 as they did against Morocco, I just remind you, this is not where we're trying out new players. You've got to figure out your starting 11 and where to work, and there's some homework to be done. Still, guys like Sean Johnson and Joe Scally got a run. So this is a result that they grinded. Uh, Uruguay, when you bring in Cavani and Valverde and Vecino and... Uh, Pelestri, all these really good players. And they held in there, even though the very few chances in the second half. I'm just talking about the defense, and let's talk about Joe Scally. Joe Scally should not be on the 2022 roster. 19-year-old that we look towards for 2026. He had a game which, to me, was one of the worst performances. It just it wasn't there. Uh, he was lost. He had one good tackle. It was a nice one, but there was no redeeming quality. He was out of position. He was way too narrow. He turned the ball over. He was late on challenges. It was, it was, it, I, I, the only time, I, when Jordan Pifok came up against the, came in the game at the Aztec and looked completely lost, it kind of reminded me of that. So I, I don't want to diminish Joe Scali. I like him, but this is clearly a case where Greg Berhalter, you know, he didn't bring him in right away. Maybe if he brought him in sooner, it'd be a little different. He's not there yet. This is a kid you develop for the future. Don't put the pressure on him. He's not ready. He's not ready. And that was really a troubling performance. Uh, he was out of his depth. I don't. Listen, that's the, the reality because the backup left back spot to me is flying up the list of stuff that we have to res uh, resolve. If Anthony Robinson's good for 90 minutes, 90 minutes, 90 minutes, great. But that's, you know, that's wishful thinking. I think you need some cover at one game. Who's going to be? I don't know. George Bello hasn't been great. Kevin Paredes hasn't played, but I would like to see him there. Shaq Moore, right back, could play there. <clears throat> could look a little different. Someone out of position, maybe Dest... <laughs> you got to have another part. If Desk can come in and cover, but you need someone there who can cover on a little bit more frequency. So uh, that is a to-do list. Because with the other positions where we don't know the, the starter is, whether it's goalie, number nine, center back alongside Walker Zimmerman, 
at least we have body of work on some guys. We just don't know it left back. Push comes to shove, it's probably going to be Aaron Long. And that's why he started these two games at center back. Push comes to shove, it's going to be Jesus Ferreira at number nine. And Matt Turner will be the goalie. Sean Johnson made things interesting, and that's what you wanted him to do. But we're late in the game. What else is, uh, what else is required here? Uh, Christian Pulisic, 50th cap, uh, historic number at his age. Very few are in front of him. Uh, he's fine. He's fine. And it was good to see him get this workload because this is the, the cadence that you're going to get in the World Cup. A game, four days later, a game. You want to see him kind of get in there, and he was it, was, it was solid enough. Tim Weah, I thought he even played better here than in Morocco, where he looked too direct, and, but he looks like a keeper. There were some good things with the front three, so we get to Jesus Ferreira. And Jesus Ferreira, <laughs> he's got to score a goal here. There was, I think it was unfair, uh, some people on social media, and they're going, he had all these chances. He had one great chance, which he helped create. There was a ball that came in, he had to lean back. You can't assume that he's going to make that in. But that one chance on top of the couple chances in the last game and the qualifying rounds that he had chances is it's troubling. And if it's expected goals as criteria, it's not looking good for Fedeta. Haji Wright came in and he played 30 minutes and he was a ghost. Did not see him at all. I saw enough in Morocco that I, I think we keep Haji Wright around and still make him compete for that number nine. And with Ferreira, the issue is not scoring goals. So who, who do you put in that's scoring goals? Because there's nobody who's scoring goals for the national team. Haji Wright missed his chance in that first game. And that's fine. It's one chance. But when you're looking, if Haji Wright gets a goal, the question here for me for Haji Wright is he didn't even get involved in the attack. Ferreira helps these attacks develop. He'll come back. He'll play with his back to goal. He'll combine with Pulisic. He combines with Weah. And that has created a chemistry which... We need him to score a goal, but the options are not better looking elsewhere. I, I, I'm, I'm happy enough, and I'm not thrilled, but you want to get rid of uh, questions. You just have to hope that he's going to score a goal here. So for right now, Fadeda's got that job because there's no one else. Haji Wright, maybe these two games, uh, he starts them. Maybe he starts one in the Nations League. Maybe we get a, a bigger sample size, but you have to take it with a grain of salt when you're playing against Grenada in El Salvador. All in all, by the way, I, look, when you look at a messy defense, missing chances, our midfield's great. Our midfield's getting stronger by the day, and we'll get to that. This is a, this is a result that in the World Cup you would take against Uruguay as a top 10 team, top 15 team in the world. Could easily make a run here in Qatar, quarterfinal, semifinal. They usually make the quarterfinals these days. And Diego Alonso hasn't tasted, I mean, they, they, what do they say? They didn't, he's not even trailed a game since he's taken over. Uruguay is in an ascendancy. And they slaughtered Mexico. Ran circles around Mexico. The U.S. come out with a scoreless tie. Let's talk about the midfield. Yunus Musa, my man of the match, just getting the ball deep and getting out. Now, the question with, you know, dribbling out, he is a physical specimen. Uh, the, Opponents, by the way, don't like playing the U.S. We saw it with Morocco and we saw it with Uruguay. It's not a comfortable situation. The fitness, the running, uh, and then these athletes like Musa as well is... When we say the U.S. may not want to play this, I'm pretty sure that opponents are like, ah, not crazy about that. Hopefully it'll be more than three opponents of the World Cup. And I'm confident it will be now. I like what I've seen here. I have liked what I've seen. USA 54% possession. Nine shots, Uruguay had 12, four on target, three on target for the U.S. Better passing numbers for the U.S. than Uruguay. So the numbers even back it up. This is good. This is a good development. You should be pleased after these two games. And these are the important games. Grain of salt time for the other two. But these are the two important games. Weston McKinney doesn't look, uh, didn't look great for obvious reasons, but is out of sync with the rest of the midfield. Tyler Adams, decent. I wish Musa could play a little deeper, but we obviously need the cover that Adams provides and the distribution. But he's not been wham, bam, thank you, ma'am, by any means. So, and the reason I say this is because there's three midfield spots. And you have McKinney, Musa, Musa's lock, stock, two smoke and barrels in there, the starting 11. Adams, that would be your three. And then you have 
Brendan Aronson has been put in the midfield and looked fantastic against Morocco. Luca Della Torre's kind of put his hand up. So you have at least five guys competing now for those three spots, but who comes out? It's a uh, it's very interesting uh, discussion to have. I think you still keep it Adams, McKinney, Musa, but you got to get Aronson on the field and you got to have Musa on the field. I think that's right now, without hesitation, the big 100% you take away out of this. Weston McKinney's got to get, really got to get back into the rhythm here. Uh, coming off the injury, but even before the injury, there was moments where it just a little bit out of sync. Minor spots. I would, I, he's such an important player, but it's not been the McKinney we've seen uh, earlier on in these cycles. All in all, though, the standard for the midfield is very high, and I'm more comfortable there than in any other spot on the field. We're kind of just picking at, you know, nitpicking here a little bit as we take a big picture look at everything. There we go. Our crowds have to get better. We love what they did, uh, uh, the American Outlaws in Kansas City, but we need like someone who can come in there and really get the songs going, you know? Get a nice beat. Get a little ritmo, a little salsa merengue, whatever that might be. But uh, we got to get that going. But we have some work to do. June the 10th in Q2 Stadium in Austin, USA Grenada. June the 14th in El Salvador. These are games that uh, that next group of players will, will get the most out of. Maybe something more. Maybe something more. I'll be watching, and I'll be on here on the Soccer OG to give you the full recap, so I'll join you there. Mark your calendars for the World Cup. We've got three opponents. We'll have a Soccer OG group preview very soon as well. Check out the Soccer OG podcast. Let's keep the momentum going.